Good afternoon. My name is JJ Spoon, and I'm a professor of political science and director of the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to our third conversation on Europe of the semester, which is the third in our series, Creating Europe Through, which is part of our Year of Creating Europe, Year of Creating Europe series. Each of these conversations explores the creation of what Europe is, Europeanness, and European identity. Today's topic is Creating Europe Through Multilingualism. Our final roundtable in the series will be on April 15th and will focus on creating Europe through the Creative Europe program and other arts programs. You will have the opportunity to ask questions using the chat or the Q&A function. Feel free to post a question at any time during the discussion and I will try to get to as many of these as I can. Um, once we get to uh, the Q&A portion of the roundtable, if you'd like to ask a question yourself, you can use the raise hand feature. Today's conversation is sponsored by the European Studies Center which is part of the University Center of International Studies at Pitt. It is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. Our co-sponsors today are the Center for European Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Florida International University, the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. To learn more about our future and our past conversations on Europe and programming we are doing with other EU-funded institutions in the US through the hashtag JM in the USA initiative, please visit our website. And one of my colleagues will put that in the chat. Finally, I wanna thank Iris Matievich and Kenny Riley at, uh, at our center for their help with today's event. In 1958, the first regulation passed by the EEC was about language. It established that the four official languages of the community of six countries were French, German, Italian, and Dutch. The official number of official languages has now grown to 24. Translation and interpretation services are made available for all of these, but not all languages spoken in the EU are recognized as official languages. In a polity that now constitutes 27 member states, the issue of language is paramount. Language and multilingualism influences politics, policies, policymaking, and identity in varied ways, but language is complicated. It can unify, but it can also divide. It can depoliticize, but also politicize. Today I'm joined by a panel of interdisciplinary experts to discuss these important topics. First, I'd like to welcome Niels Ringo, who is Professor of Political Science and Jean Monnet Chair and Director of the Center for European Studies and the Jean Monnet EU Center of Excellence for Comparative Populism at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research focuses on European Union politics, legislatures, political parties, social networks, and elections. His new book on multilingualism in the institutions of the EU, titled The Languages of Politics, Multilingual Policymaking in the European Union, is forthcoming with the University of Michigan Press. Previously, he published Bridging the Information Gap, Legislative Member Organizations as Social Networks in the United States and the European Union with Jennifer Victor, and Who Decides and How, Preferences, Uncertainty, and Policy Choice in the European Parliament. Welcome, Niels. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Katerina Strani, who is Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Intercultural Research Center at Harriet Watt University in Scotland. She has a background in languages and politics. She has published articles on intercultural dialogue, racism and hate speech, language and heritage, and has edited a volume on multilingualism and politics. She has led EU-funded projects on racism and discrimination and two language and culture apps for newly arrived migrants and refugees and for indigenous languages. For the 2021-22 academic year, she will be a visiting scholar at the Institute of Anthropology and Ethnology and at the Institute of Applied Linguistics at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland. Welcome, Katerina. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Karen McCullough, who is a professor of law and language and Birmingham fellow at the University of Birmingham in the UK. She is also a fellow of the Robert Schumann Institute of European Affairs at the University of Luxembourg. Her research interests and expertise are in multilingual law production and the relationship between law, language, and translation in supranational legal orders, in particular, the European Union. She has led a number of large research projects focusing on multilingual law production in the EU, including the European Research Council funded project, Law and Language at the European Court of Justice. Welcome, Karen. And last but certainly not least, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Michaela Gazzola, who is Lecturer of Public Policy and Administration at the School of Applied Social and Political Sciences at the University of Ulster in the UK and co-director of the Center for Public Administration in the same university. 
His research focuses on the study of language policies and the economic and social implications of multilingualism. He's the author of over 70 publications. He is the editor of the Journal of Language Problems and Language Planning. Before joining Ulster University, he worked at Humboldt University of Berlin and the University of Leipzig in Germany and the University of Geneva and Lugano in Switzerland, the University of Ottawa in Canada and the Institute for Ethnic Studies in Ljubljana in Slovenia. He has consulted for, among others, the European Parliament and the Swiss Confederation. So welcome to everyone, and I'm very much looking forward to our, to our conversation. I'd like to start um, with uh, a tour of, of our participants um, and, and to respond to the following question. So we know that the EU's motto um, for the last one of, I should, should probably say, but the, the EU's motto for the, uh, since, uh, for the last 20 years or so has been united through diversity. How can language be both a unifier and a divider, as I mentioned in, in the introduction? Um, uh, Niels, how about we start with you on that? Sure. Uh, thank you uh, for having us. I really look forward to the conversation. Um, I, you know, very generally speaking, uh, language is really one of the primary identity markers out there. And so when we uh, think kind of beyond, uh, you know, physical markers of somebody's identity, language is really pretty, you know, a pretty close second. So the moment we start talking to somebody, uh, we are able to, you know, essentially determine whether or not somebody might be in our in-group or in our out-group. And um, that is fundamentally, right, why it can both unite uh, and divide. Great, thank you. Uh, Karen. Great, thank you. I'm also delighted to be here uh, today. So I think, you know, multilingualism is particularly a defining feature of the EU. And uh, when you look at all the work in anthropology that has been done over the, the sort of existence of the EU, where anthropologists have tried to look at whether an EU culture has, you know, exists or whether the EU has been successful in creating that culture. Multilingualism is, is, a, is a huge aspect of that. Um, but I think we also need to remember that, you know, language is used as a tool or has been used as a tool to create nation states. And I think, you know, your question about how languages can unite and divide, we could probably talk about that for the entire uh, webinar, we won't. Um, but, you know, in the EU, as in other organizations, institutions or, or states, um, some languages are more equal than others. I, so, you know, as Neil said, it, it, it's, it's two sides of the one coin, I guess. They will unite and divide pretty much equally. Great, thank you. Katerina. Um, thank you uh, as well on my part. Thank you very much for inviting me here to participate in this discussion. Um, so I agree with, the, with, with Niels and with, uh, and with Karen. Um, and also, if I may add that language can be a unifier because it is, because it is linked with identity and culture. But it can also be a divider for precisely the same reasons, because then we have questions such as whose language um, is it, whose identity, uh, then we get into the business of language hierarchies, which uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about um, in this discussion today. So tensions between minority and majority languages, the role of heritage languages, however we define them, um, the role of uh, ethno-linguistic assumptions, the assumptions that we have one particular language associated with one particular uh, community or with one particular ethnicity. So all these uh, can be dividers. And I think in a paradoxical manner, because of the link of such a strong link with identity and culture, this can have sort of the dual, um, the dual function that also Niels talked about of, of unifying and, and dividing. But if I may um, add something else about the United in Diversity motto that you that you mentioned, um, this is, I mean, this is the motto of the EU now, and it's it's pretty much the EU brand now, diversity, isn't it? But it's a motto that's quite heavily criticised because it focuses on certain aspects of linguistic diversity and ignores other aspects of diversity. Um, but I'm sure we'll be able to discuss this um, to discuss this later on. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, Michaela. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, my reply to this question is um, none in the sense that uh, it's not language as such that is 
a unifier or a divider is how language is managed through language policy and uh, public policy in this, in this area. So how language, languages are managed in society uh, makes basically the whole difference. Um, so uh, languages, we, all, we already heard that promote in-group communication. At the same time, they can promote in between group, I mean, communication between groups. Um, it's what, you know, the most important difference is how they are managed and how they are uh, presented to speakers, more, more precisely how the relationships between languages are presented to speaker. And uh, uh, language is just, you know, language you use. And what does it mean for you and what are the purposes you use? Depends on the context, and this cost that this context is shaped by language policy. Thank you, thank you all. I think that was a really great uh, introduction. In fact, to all many of the topics um, that that we will hopefully um, we will hopefully touch on. This is uh, always the the challenge of these roundtables is that there are so many topics to cover, and we can of course. Um, uh, only touch on some, but you've all pointed to some really important things that we'll get back to. Um, I want to step back for a minute um, because we have, um, as yourselves are an interdisciplinary panel, we have an interdisciplinary audience um, and many who are not focused on issues of language and, and multilingualism. And I wonder if we could just step back for a moment and provide a definition to a term that I've been using that you've all been using of what exactly multilingualism is in the context that we are discussing. So Niels, do you want to perhaps provide a little bit of uh, and anyone else that may want to jump in as well um, in terms of what in terms of terminology. Uh, sure, but uh, I, I think that that's uh, it's a kind of multifaceted term that's also used differently in different contexts. So you might actually, if you had asked one of the other panelists, right, you might have gotten a slightly different definition. Um, uh, so it's, it's kind of complicated, right? So depending on the context, multilingualism can refer to the language repertoire of individuals. Um, it, it can refer to uh, you know, the language repertoires amongst groups of people, but also language use in, you know, whole societies uh, or in organizations like inside the institutions of the European Union, but also, you know, perhaps in multinational uh, uh, corporations, for example. Um, and so depending, you know, on what you're talking about, when you say multilingualism, you may be referring, right, to somebody's ability to use several languages, the coexistence of different languages within one territory, or language practices within uh, an organization. Um, so, um, you know, so the, the research of some of the people on this panel really focus on multilingualism at the societal level more than the organizational level, right, while others like uh, Karen and myself um, focus on, you know, what is sometimes referred to as institutional multilingualism in the EU. Um, so basically the kind of formal and informal languages, you know, language rules and practices inside the institutions. Um, so for my own work, I've made this, you know, kind of additional distinction there where, um, you know, when we're thinking about multilingualism inside the EU institutions, it really has two, you know, major components. So one of them is that um, you have interactions that take place between native speakers of different languages in a shared non-native language. Um, and, and the other one is that you might have speakers of different native languages that rely on translators or interpreters um, to uh, basically communicate uh, with, with one another. Great, thank you. Um, since Niels opened the, 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 the door there, does anyone else want to jump in on different ways of thinking about uh, multilingual, multilingualism as a concept in your own disciplines and the way that you think about it that um, may be different or add on to what he's, uh, he's already mentioned? Or are we? All right then, well, why don't we move um, to the to the topic of um, uh, language and society. So um, Katerina, perhaps you could start and um, start think, um, uh, helping us to understand the ways that language and multilingualism affect contemporary society and politics. Oof, yes, thank you. Um, how long have you got? <laughs> um, it is, uh... So it's not very easy to answer in a, in a nutshell, but perhaps we can we can scratch the surface here and hopefully start a good discussion. Uh, there are many ways uh, that language and multilingualism can affect language, um, sorry, society and politics, uh, because languages and their speakers, but also language use, have political dimensions and they have political value. It's all about uh, it's all about inclusion and exclusion of languages and 
uh, also by extension, also their speakers. In multilingual societies, Niels was, was saying before that some of us have focused on society. So I am one of those people who has focused on societies rather than institutions. Um, uh, and I uh, and I'm arguing that multilingual societies have always been the norm rather than the exception. Languages have a certain status. So we have dominant languages, we can have official languages, minority, indigenous, however, they, they all have a label attached to them. These may be official labels or unofficial designations of languages, but they create a hierarchy. And this leads to ensuing tensions, uh, competition for recognition, uh, and competition for a status that will give more resources and will also affect linguistic landscapes. So when we talk about societies, uh, for example, linguistic landscapes are very important, how visible languages are. So not only how language is spoken, but how, how, how visible the language is in public signs, in uh, ambulances, police cars and shops, how many languages can you actually see? Um, and it's about also differentiation, it's about being different from what is seen as the norm or what is seen as, as, as the dominant language. Um, because also, um, speaking speaking someone's language in in public or in uh, in society in general is in the end all about performance of identity it's a way of someone performing their identity we have um i'm based in the uk and in the uk most people speak and understand english so the choice to use scots or gallic or cornish or welsh or Urdu uh, in public sex settings is, is a performance of identity, really. Um, and in some societies, people don't feel comfortable speaking their languages uh, freely in public at all. So this is another uh, element or another dimension, if you like. And there's also finally the role of education uh, in multilingualism. There's also state language policies and how these affect the way languages are viewed, are taught uh, and are used. And we should all, when we talk about languages, we should always remember that these languages are tied to some speakers. So we shouldn't uh, divide or we shouldn't divorce languages from their speakers. This is about people as it is about languages. So in a nutshell, I think um, that's all I could identify. Great, thank you. No, and I'm glad you brought you know up the role um, of of education, right? Because obviously that plays a very very important part um, in this. Mikhail, I wonder if we could circle back to you um, and, and your thoughts on this. And you um, mentioned earlier sort of this idea of you know sort of the management of language and how that may fit into this when we're talking about the role of language in society as well. Yeah, so I think there are three essentially big areas here that you know are relevant uh, for. Uh, on the one hand, multilingualism and languages, on the other hand, social uh, social uh, and economic and, and political life. So from the point of view of uh, politics, languages are absolutely central in democratic deliberation, participation to democratic life in that sense, uh, debates, um, getting information about candidates and just following what the government is doing. Um, from the point of view of, so the, the, the big question there is uh, how many people are linguistically excluded. Some people use the word disenfranchised when their languages are not used and not recognized by government and by public administration in general, um, i.g. Uh, the tax office um, and the register and so on and so forth. So uh, politically, languages are key because they are the tools that allow us to navigate in the public administration, so the apparatus of the state, and if we are citizen of a country, to participate actively in political life. Um, second, uh, economically, languages can be seen as a form of human capital, uh, so a stock of uh, knowledge that is acquired at a, stock, uh, at a cost, i.g. through education or through experience. And then this knowledge can be used in the labor market and give you advantages. Um, sometimes language skills gives you disadvantage in the labor market because of your accent, because you are not proficient in the dominant language of the country you move to. So this is something that has to be dealt with. Uh, there is a large uh, uh, body of literature about the um, relationships between language skills on the one hand and employment status 
and or uh, wage differentials of migrants and of people using languages as foreign languages in their home country. And the third uh, dimension, I think, is social. Uh, I'm not using social here in the sense of Facebook uh, uh, and, uh, and Twitter. I'm talking here in terms of your web, your set of relationships in your life. Uh, well, you know, knowing language means to be part of groups, to be able to develop networks, to have access also to all sorts of social services that are that can be private or public or publicly provided. And, uh, and this can create barriers to you and or can give you a lot of privilege. We are dealing with now here in many European countries with huge problems concerning with information and the COVID epidemic. So uh, linguistic minorities are particularly badly hit in the UK. Ethnic minorities have been particularly badly hit, not only because they don't have access to information concerning the virus and all things that um, uh, are available to fight the spread of the virus, but also because they don't have access to all sorts of information necessarily to protect their business from failure, uh, follow scheme and support. So the broad, the range of topics related to language and society and politics is huge. Uh, and that's why interdisciplinary uh, research is, um, is required. It's not just about social linguistics, it's about, uh, as I said, political science, economics, social policy and sociology. Can you imagine? Huge area. But this is because language is such, you know, is an, it's everywhere. You, you do everything within your own language. So necessarily it has an impact on all, almost all uh, aspects of your social life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, I think I think that that point is so important that that language is, as I said earlier, paramount. Right? It's it's so important, and so it makes so much sense that it affects so so many facets of of, of life. So I want to flip now away um, from the societal piece of this, and we of course can come back to it and talk a bit more about the institutional and the policy making side of things, and how and why multilingualism has become such a feature of. EU politics, policy making, law creation, um, et cetera. So Karen, why don't we start start with you on the legal side of things? Great. Um, if if we may make a, a sort of a link between um, what we've just been talking about on the societal level um, and, and what Michaela said about language as a currency, I thought was really interesting because of course, languages are absolutely a currency, but because they are so inextricably linked with cultures, you know, the elephant in the room is that a language for someone like me, language knowledge and, and multilingualism or plurilingualism is absolutely a currency as sort of a, a white, middle class, well educated European. But, you know, there's so much research out there looking at the language knowledge in, in migrants and language ability in migrants that it's not viewed in the same way. Um, in many um, EU member states and, and you know, ar around the world as well. So, um, you know, that is a whole other aspect of this policy, currency and societal um, aspect coming together. Um, and in also just while um, Katerina was chatting there, I was, I keep being reminded of a sort of protection for minority languages is also very, can be quite controversial uh, in terms that uh, in terms that the, the way that regional or minority languages are defined very much depends on a territorial um, link or a link with sovereignty. Um, as so for example, the European Charter um, for regional minority languages is a Euro Council of Europe instrument. Um, I think only 13 EU member states have signed up to or 16 EU member states maybe have signed up to it. But, it, you know, it is very clear about what constitutes a regional language or a minority language. And there are so many languages that simply cannot be protected, including the languages of migrants uh, in, in the states that have signed up to, to the Charter. So um, I think there, you know, there, the links are just so interesting but sorry I digressed from your question there <laughs> um, which was about uh, multilingualism being a feature of lawmaking is that if, is that what you're asking me yeah and um, so you know I, I think it, it, why the, the why is 
is quite a simple one to answer when you know when, when the EU was created it was decided that um, there would be these six uh, four, four languages covering the six member states and everybody would be considered equal and then as the enlargements have happened over the years the languages have just been added on um, so the, the why you know you, we could talk for days about citizens being able to access the law that affects them but you know in the early days the, it wasn't really affecting individual citizens this this new EEC law as, as it was then it was speaking to states initially and then very quickly it moved on to bringing in rights and, and duties on on individuals and at that point you can make the argument that it's important for an individual to understand what law binds him or her. But you can also, again, you know, on the other side of that, you, you can argue that only the 24 EU official languages are, are the ones that are protected or the ones that are, you know, that, that individuals can access or, or member states can access um, EU institutions and EU policy making and, and stuff through. So, so that, that is interesting. The, the how I think is more interest is more interesting to me. So you know this is what I look at. I, I'm very interested in how you produce law in 24 languages and uh, what is the process behind that and can you say the same can you have the same legal effect across 27 member states in 24 different languages? Um, and you know again, <laughs> we could spend a whole webinar uh, talking about that. but I, if we take, the European Court of Justice, as an example, um, the, each institution manages things slightly differently. Um, each institution, and, and Niels can talk a bit more to, to the, the political institutions than I can, um, but each institution tends to have a working language. So for the Court of Justice, the working language is French. And the reason for choosing French was simply because, you know, it, the Court of Justice's seat was in, is in Luxembourg um, and uh, it's just historically that was chosen, the working language was French. So everything within the court is produced, the documents are produced in French. And um, so you have translation going on as documents come in and as documents go out. Um, and that's sort of a very simple overview. Of course, the reality is very different. There's lots of layers of hidden translation. Um, there's, there's the fact that the people are producing the various legal documents in a language that usually isn't their mother tongue. Um, and, you know, it's a whole, a whole ecosystem of multilingualism and plurilingualism happening uh, in there. And I think the key thing to, to take away is that translation is really, really important in the production of law, legal instruments in, in the EU. Niels might want to come in on, on talking about more political institution. Yeah, I'll, yes, Neil, um, I'll come to you in one minute. And I think I just wanted to comment and Neil can pick up on this also, but just the something that I was thinking about um, as you as you were talking, Karen, is just the, the meaning of words are different, right? Of course, in different languages and the challenges of translating something from Greek into French and back into Greek and then into you know, and that sort of thing. And the challenges of, of that, that officially the translation can happen right but that the, the challenge though of making meaning um be the, the same across different languages i'm sure is um is one of the many many challenges when we talk about um both law production and, and policy production as well um in, in in multiple languages and i think in in terms of law production you're not just talking about transferring meaning across languages you're trying to produce the same legal effect mm -hmm. so it's not just translating across it not even just translating across legal languages you, you know you ha you're trying to have the same legal effect across 27 legal systems mm -hmm. um you know which which all have their differences and, and idiosyncrasies and um <coughs> excuse me and i think that is that really is a challenge and then of course you also have concepts that are entirely new uh, to, to some legal systems. Um, so, you know, rendering those concepts in a language that can be understood by the people who have to apply the law in member states is, mm -hmm. is also a huge challenge when those concepts may not be um, something that they're used to. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Niels, perhaps you can pick up on this in, in, in the institutions of the EU 
Yeah, let me actually, uh, I mean, first actually answer your, your question about the how and why. Um, sure. and, and I think that there's actually a few points that have come up that I think we can kind of summarize mm -hmm. um, just to take them home. Um, uh, one thing that I would add, though, that that's uh, so apparently uh, in terms of the how uh, it was actually um, uh, concerns about language equality within Belgium that uh, are um, one of the big reasons for why we ended up with the four official languages early on. Um, so French was the um, the the uh, uh, the language in which the um, treaty for the European Coal and Steel community was of own, it was only authentic in French. But then when it came to the question of uh, the language, you know, which languages would be the languages of the community, uh, Germany was very adamant that German should be on equal standing with uh, or equal footing with French. Uh, and that then raised concerns within Belgium, right, that basically two of their language communities would be represented, uh, but the Dutch would not. And so then it was actually Belgium that said, oh, we want Dutch in there. And the Dutch, of course, were okay with that pr proposition. And then, uh, you know, then not leave, you know, not including Italian was really not uh, an option. So, you know, you kind of end Ended up with the four languages in part because of uh, Belgian uh, linguistic politics, which is interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the question of the why, I think we've touched on you know basically the you know three main reasons. One of them is that there is this kind of symbolic aspect to this, right? Like it's an international community that we're talking about. Um, you know, uh, the member states were very insistent on basically allowing their individual languages to retain their position as markers of national identity, and so it's kind of indicative of this continuous attempt by the part of the EU to basically strike a balance between on the one hand assuring national uh, sovereignty, but then on the other hand also, you know, uh, constructing a political union. Um, and then second uh, is this aspect of democracy in the EU that uh, Michaela talked about, right, that, uh, you know, is really important for people to be able to actually participate in politics. They can only do that if they have the information that they need to um, actually be informed about politics and also to hold their representatives accountable. And then those, you know, representatives also need to be able to participate in politics, right? And they can't be excluded because they, you know, don't have a particular language repertoire, right? So that's, you know, there's all, all these different um, representative aspects to uh, multilingualism. And, you know, that's one reason why it also exists in the EU. Uh, and of course, that has become more important over time as the EU has actually become more powerful, right, and more, if you will, intrusive on people's lives. Um, and then finally, there's this legal aspect that Karen talked about, right, that because the languages are equally, well, the, the language versions of EU law are equally authentic, um, right, people basically need to be able to understand the laws that will end up um, having an effect on them. And so, you know, those are the kind of three, three aspects um, that, that I would highlight. Great, thank you. Um, I want to circle back to, um, to, 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 to a point that um, Katerina mentioned and, and, and get um, um, Katerina and, and Michaela into the conversation thinking about sort of the, the, the language regime within the EU and sort of the languages that are recognized, right? We have the 24 languages that are recognized, but by no means, of course, as it's already been mentioned several times, does that cover anywhere near the number of languages that are spoken with within, the, within Europe, within the European Union? We have, uh, there's the minority languages, indigenous languages, um, the languages of migrants, um, and how that all um, sort of plays into um, the, the, the sort of the, the politics of, uh, of language in society um, and, and, some per, and, and perhaps some examples that come to mind that really kind of hit home the, the sort of official side that Karen and Niels have been talking about and then perhaps the unofficial side um, where things perhaps are even more messy as it were or complicated or nuanced depending on how we want to think about it. Um, so Katerina, do you want to um, come back to some of those points that you, you brought up before? Is it about Sorry, I need to go back now to what you were asking, to what That's you were about, asking. So is it about the status of languages? Or? Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, how the fact that we have um, sort of the official languages, but then sort of the whole sort of ecosystem of unofficial languages, minority languages, immigrant languages, um, indigenous, etc. And just how that sort of plays into the, the sort of the fabric of language um, in, in European society. Um, okay, yes. Um, so it is, there's many things that are going on as, uh, as you've just said, and migration is a big, um, uh, is obviously a dimension that is, uh, th that we need to consider because it's reshaping and it's changing linguistic landscapes um, or even just linguistic ecologies uh, everywhere. So in the UK, 
for example, the number, even the number of speakers um, of immigrant languages, if we can call them that, I use, I use this term loosely, um, is difficult to establish because of issues with census questions, for example. I can I can talk about the census later, but it's 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 a big um, it's a big topic here. Um, so um, when it comes to and I and I agree by the way with what Karen said um, earlier. I I think you probably saw me uh, nodding my head really vigorously when she was talking about immigrant languages. So the the issue is or one of the issues is the fact that with migration. And with immigrant languages in public spheres and in societies and in politics, we have focused a lot on language learning as the key to the social inclusion of, of migrants. However, their own languages, as Karen very aptly said earlier, do not seem to be valued or count for their own linguistic capital. So learning foreign languages is a key priority. And indeed, it has been a key priority for the EU. If we can talk about the EU, uh, you know, in 2007, multilingualism was given its own portfolio. Um, and we had a dedicated commissioner in the European Commission for multilingualism. But then in 2010, suddenly this was sort of demoted and incorporated into the portfolio for the Commissioner for Education, Culture, Multilingualism and Youth. So what does multilingual, it's, it's a little bit um, confusing, I think. Um, what the status of multilingualism is um, in the EU and what the, um, for, for the EU and what the priorities are. Is there a focus on, do we have a, do we have a, um, a state of what some scholars have called hegemonic multilingualism? So yes, um, we are unity and diversity and all that, and let's have a multilingual um, society and also a multilingual political system, but let's only privilege the 24 official languages and let's leave all the other ones out. Um, or, and, or do we have a system where we, you know, it's a multilingual system and we encourage language learning, but again, as long as you only learn these 24 languages, and do we have a system then where these immigrant languages or or minority languages or whatever, we talked about language designations earlier, uh, how are they valued? How are they uh, counted in someone's linguistic capital? And what does this really do for power differentials between people who are competent or non-competent speakers of some of these languages? Um, and I think it all comes back again to language as a marker and marketness um, of someone speaking a language or, or, or not speaking a language. But if, if we come back to the EU and multilingualism, uh, I am a little bit confused with some of the mixed messages regarding, um, you know, which languages are um, promoted and which languages are not, but also regarded migration and language education. So we have migration let's take all these migrants and teach them our own languages, but what do we do with the languages that they bring? And I guess the question would be, what is the aim of all this? So what is the aim to have multilingualism as long as it's limited to the official languages of the EU? What do we want a multilingual Europe to look like? Um, I think for me, this is in the question you were asking, this would be the, um, the, the topic that we, would, um, that we would need to focus on. I think that's a really interesting point that you just uh, sort of ended on, which is, you know, this idea of a multilingual Europe and what that looks like. And I, and I would sort of follow that up, not necessarily for uh, to be answered, but, but who decides, right? Who decides what that, um, and then that inherently obviously is, um, gets us to something I want to come back to in a bit about the politicization um, of language, which we'll, we'll come back to uh, in, in a minute. Michaela, I wonder if you could um, uh, jump in on this um, and, and offer some thoughts on, on some of these, uh, these points um, that, that Katerina was making. Well, yeah, it's a very broad uh, topic. I think we should make a distinction between three different levels uh, of, of analysis and clearly refer those to uh, the competence or the scope of action of the European Union. The European Union is not a state. It's a, it's a mix between a supranational organization and an international organization with much more and more powers than any other international organization, but much less, less powers than any national states. Um, so the European Union has nothing to say about education, for example. Uh, the, the EU has no competence. This is competence of the national state in some countries, i.g. Germany, the competence of education is at the, at the level of um, uh, lender, so the states that, that, that form the confederation, the same is 
in Switzerland, for example, right? So um, the European Union in, in education, for example, can just give guidelines and financial support, but not more. So as I said, there are three levels we have to consider. The first is multilingualism within uh, the institutions of the European Union. So how civil servants work together and how uh, different nationalities are represented, uh, how translation and interpreting services work within the European Union institutions. Second level is how the European Union communicates toward the external world. Um, so toward citizens, companies, um, et cetera. So, um, uh, and, 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 and towards the national governments. And the third level is uh, what the European Union can do in areas in which it has no real uh, strong powers or no exclusive competence. And it can be, it can do not that much. Um, in terms, for example, of supporting minority languages, well, there was um, a program, uh, sorry, to be more precise, a budget line uh, that the European Union used until 1980, 1998 to support financially product aims at supporting minority languages. But then there was no, um, I think following the request of the United Kingdom, um, there was no legal basis for this um, funding and that line was abolished. And, and now support towards minority languages goes through the so-called mainstreaming approach, which is usually, you know, people say, I mean, researchers have found that it's much less effective. Um, and the European Union can just fund, you know, um, networks of associations and institutions working with regional minority languages. The same applies for migrants. Uh, probably just to recap what, I mean, to, you know, go back to what Katarina was saying, uh, probably today in the European Union institutions, I mean, the European Union policy uh, about multilingualism, the only thing that is really interesting for them is um, multilingual schools. This is the only thing that remained from the golden age of multilingualism in 2007. Uh, when there was a commissioner for multilingualism, uh, multilingualism had its own portfolio. The European Union adopted a broad range of initiatives to promote language learning, to promote mobility, to promote many things. Nowadays, I think there's much, much less and very little interest for multilingualism at the moment as a policy area in the EU and uh, much of research and uh, activities concern only integration of migrants. Um, so the situation is very different from um, 10 to 15 years ago. Great, uh, thank you. So we've already had lots of um, comments and, and, and questions from the audience, um, uh, our virtual audience, um, lots, lots of uh, interest in everything that's been said. So I wanna um, bring in one question now to, to Michaela and to Katerina that I think that speaks to some of the things that, that you've been talking about and to uh, whoever would, if, uh, uh, which one of you would, uh, whoever would like to jump in is welcome to. Um, so I'll read, I'll read the question um, and it's, it's also in, in the chat as well. Um, and it's the following, the EU has recently rejected the formulation of further binding legal provisions to protect regional minor and minority languages, the minority safe pack. What is your take on the role that translation and interpreting could play in bridging the political unwillingness against non-official languages? Who would like to? offer their thoughts on this. Uh, if I may add, you know, there, there, are, there are, again, two levels. So at the level of, at the institutional level, so the EU as an international organization, uh, I mean, a supranational organization, they are, um, you know, there is, you know, there are some languages that are defined as quasi-official, semi-official and, these are at the moment Catalan, Basque, and Galician, and they can be used uh, as you know, for official purposes, but the costs are borne by the nation state that requires that, that is Spain. So in terms of uh, institutional support for regional minority languages, if the nation state where these languages are spoken agrees, uh, they can be used in the parliament or for other purposes. And this is uh, the institutional level. In general, at the level of what the EU can do for the external world through public policies, especially through fundings, this is perhaps the most important policy instrument the European Union has, has is to support 
um, networks as the NPLD, National Network to Promote Linguistic Diversity, and other networks. Um, and in that sense, translation interpreters plays probably a very uh, modest role. Um, I know that the EU rejected the uh, minority safe pack because they were arguing that minority languages can be already be supported through mainstreaming, that is, through other projects, for example, regional development. That was the argument that the European Commission used. Great, uh, thank and, you. Yeah, Katerina, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, if I if, if I may come in, just to add to what uh, to, to what Michele was saying. So I think again, that's at the institutional level. But um, if I understand um, the question correctly, I think the question also asked what translators and interpreters can can do. Um, and I'd like to mention here translation activists and um, language activism. And then um, I'm a trained translator and interpreter myself, and uh, I uh, was involved in my earlier younger years <laughs> uh, in, um, uh, you know, in, in social forums and in forums where translators and interpreters volunteered uh, to uh, volunteered their services to uh, precisely for the reason of helping um, lesser spoken languages or languages where this language support was not officially offered. So I think in cases where this language support is not officially offered, then these networks of uh, volunteer translators and interpreters are, are paramount. And the, the political role also of translators organizations and translator activists um, and th their social and political role really is, is, is very important in, in this case where institutional support is, is, is dwindling. Great, thank you for bringing, um, bringing that up. And, and actually, um, that might be a nice segue to talk about um, the role of translators and interpreters more generally in on the institutional side. I feel we're sort of ping-ponging back and forth a bit between the societal side and the institutional side, which is which is great. I think this provides a, a, a very full um, sense, of, a sense of, of, of things. So I wonder, Karen, if you might want to jump in and, and talk a bit about, you alluded to this a little bit before, um, but just um, uh, in the, about the role of translation, about interpretation when, we, when it comes to, to law, um, especially with the ECJ and the official language being French, but in other and other contexts uh, as well. Great, yeah, um, that was a great question, actually. I, um, <clears throat> so um, I guess the first thing to clarify is that uh, translation and interpretation are different and very separate things uh, in EU institutions. So they're, they're very different skills uh, and they're done by different sets of people. So you've got written translation on the one hand, so that, that's the transposition of one language into another in, in written form. And then interpretation is a usually sort of live interpretation as, as of spoken language. Um, and at the Court of Justice, if we're talking about uh, judgments, um, so obviously you've got legislation being produced uh, in, in the Commission largely, and uh, then the Court of Justice's role is to interpret um, the, the treaties and um, to, to sort of decide on the, the interpretation and validity of, of EU legislation, EU acts. Um, and within the Court of Justice, the translation is done by um, people known as lawyer linguists. So again, this is something to sort of terminology to clarify uh, before we start on this. So within EU institutions, you have translators and then you have these lawyer linguists so lawyer linguists are effectively lawyers who um, are, are very skilled in languages and, and they have to pass language tests, translation tests, um, as well as you know, tests on their legal skills to, to get um, a job within the institutions. And the translation done in-house uh, within the Court of Justice is all done by lawyer linguists. Um, so within other institutions, you will have translators and lawyer linguists working side by side. Um, and they'll do different jobs, uh, but, but at the Court of Justice, the lawyer linguists do translation. And in terms of what role they play, so there's the obvious one of, you know, translating the, the documents that are coming in in up to 24 languages into French and then translating them back out into, into the, the 20, uh, 23 languages. Um, so, you know, that, that obviously is very, very obvious. Um, the court uses, um, it's called a mixed translation system, so ideally they're translating directly from one language into another, but they also use pivot languages. Um, 
And there are, I believe, five pivot languages at the moment. So French is a pivot language for all of the other EU languages. And then English, um, German, Spanish, Italian, and possibly Polish by now um, have each been assigned different languages. Uh, so for example, um, anything coming into the court in Lithuanian will be translated into French and English and then translated from the English into the other languages. So there are lots of layers uh, of, of translation and that's just at the visible points. Um, so, you know, it, it's very important in the process in that sense. But what I find more, more interesting are the layers of hidden translation in the process of creation uh, of law. Because, you know, although if we take again the court as an example, although um, the, the people working there, the people who are, who are drafting the judgments and, uh, and the opinions are, are working in, or we'll take judgments uh, separately actually. So those drafting the judgments, so the judges and their team of uh, refrandaire, which are like law clerks, um, who, who draft these judgments, they're working in French, but most of them are not of French mother tongue. Um, they're, they're very, very competent in French. Um, they will have been educated, you know, across Europe and, and in the States in many cases, um, but they are effectively, you know, empirical research shows that, that they are thinking and reasoning and, and doing all of that in their own language. Uh, embedded, which is embedded in the legal system in which they were educated and then translating what they're thinking into French before there's any official translation process at all. And, and on top of that, it's not French as we know it. <laughs> it is the French of the court. Um, so there are just so many layers of hidden translation. And, and I find that very interesting because, you know, there, there, there's elements of, you know, caution or it, it might be considered an obstacle on, on one hand but also we have to remember that 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 brings a lot of power with it um, and um, I'm always very interested in understanding how these people are are, are, are doing their work um, so uh, so yeah I guess so transit you get translation in the visible points and then there's also these layers of, of hidden translation and one thing to finish on is that um, all EU legislation is equally authentic in all 24 languages. However, the judgments of the Court of Justice will only be authentic in the version of the language of procedure of the case. So if we take an example of a case coming to the court in a Greek case, for example, so if a case comes to the court, a question from a Greek uh, um, judge or, or tribunal, gets sent to the Court of Justice, it all comes in in Greek, gets translated into French, worked on in French, judgment drafted in French. Ju the judgment, the deliberations are secret, so the lawyer linguist translating the judgment back into Greek, Greek won't know where compromises might lie in the text, you know, they won't know what has gone on in the deliberations. They produce the Greek version, and it's the Greek version that is signed by the judges, whether or not they can read Greek. Um, and it's the Greek version that Seifwa, that, that is considered the authentic version. Um, so to answer your question, very, a very important role the translators play <laughs> in the production of law um, in the EU. No, thank you. I mean, just thinking about all of these different layers as you sort of, and, and what happens, you know, sort of in, in, in secret, right? Um, and, and having to kind of take the word of those that were there um, and not, and, and the challenges of going, you know, from, 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 from different languages. Um, Niels, do you want to um, maybe speak to this in the, in the context of the, of the parliament and, and sort of the role of translators and, and interpreters in, in that context? Yeah, um, and let me actually say uh, up front that a number of the things that Karen talked about um, in a kind of slightly different version actually applies in the other institutions as well, right? So she mentioned that there's a particular French in the Court of Justice, um, and you know similarly there's a kind of weird particular English uh, inside the EU institutions. Uh, the other institutions also have uh, relay translation, uh, oh, sorry, relay interpretation via via, via other uh, languages. Um, so there's a lot of similarities there, uh, despite the fact that in some sense the court is is different, right, uh, uh, from from those institutions. And uh, in fact, I've, I've you know when I started working on my project, I really didn't know uh, at all uh, much about this, and I I learned a ton from uh, Karen's work uh, in particular. Um, 
The uh, other thing that uh, you know I think is really notable is, is once you actually start thinking about the language aspect of EU uh, politics, it's everywhere, right? And this is one of those weird things where somebody like me who's studied the EU right for 20 years, it's like only you know 15 years in did I start thinking about this fundamental aspect of EU politics that really political scientists in general have not really spent much time thinking about. And so I thought that that's also kind of uh, notable. Um, but to get to your question about translators and interpreters, um, I mean, they matter in, in the first place actually through their presence alone, right? Because this, this symbolic aspect of EU politics as a, one that's built on, you know, a, a kind of uneven multilingualism, but formal equality of all the uh, different languages, right? That's, that's ensured through the presence of those uh, language service providers. So their mere presence is actually quite important. But then, uh, of course, they matter greatly in terms of um, you know, allowing people to participate in uh, EU politics. So on the one hand, uh, you do have some people who really are dependent on these language service providers to participate in EU politics. And it's definitely a disadvantage not to, you know, speak English in particular in the other institutions, right? French is really dominant in the court, uh, but in the other institutions, English has become the, the really the, the language that reigns uh, supreme. Um, and and uh, so for some people who really have too little English or maybe only have passive English, right? Like they understand, but they can't really you know, uh, contribute, right? For those people, uh, it's really critical to have um, translators and, and, and interpreters in particular in the meetings, right? Uh, uh, interpreters available. But I would actually say that uh, the interpreters are also really important for people who do use other languages, right? Because the reality is that most people are, even if they're really good, at English, right? If it's not their native language, they're missing and they're lacking something, right? And so having somebody present um, that allows them to kind of fall back on their native language if need be, I think is actually uh, kind of an under underestimated aspect, but really important uh, to participating um, in, in uh, EU politics. Um, so those are kind of the obvious ways, but like, you know, one thing that I also want to um, and, and pick up on, on something that uh, Karen was talking about, the role of uh, lawyer linguists, uh, I think they actually really matter in the other institutions in also fairly subtle ways. Um, so uh, in the other institutions, um, not, you know, not every translator is a lawyer linguist, but um, they are lawyer linguists and their job um, is, you know, to basically help in the drafting of legislation such that, um, you know, you don't run into problems in the application of EU law. Um, but uh, these lawyer linguists actually have increasingly been uh, present in negotiations um, between um, uh, legislators, say, in the European Parliament or in the uh, trilogue meetings. Um, and uh, uh, they're there in part to basically raise a red flag if somebody uses a particular term that becomes difficult to translate and they can anticipate that, right? And so um, one of the uh, implications of this though is that um, you know, politicians cannot really use ambiguous and vague language in the same way that they would in a monolingual environment. And I, you know, when you have somebody sitting there who basically, you know, politicians like vague language, right? Like basically it's kind of lubricant, right? Like it facilitates political agreement, right? But there's in, in many EU uh, negotiations, you actually have people sitting there who will raise their hand and say, oh, wait a minute, if you use that term, uh, it becomes a problem for us as we then translate it into the other languages. Um, and, you know, the politicians, you know, it's the politicians who make policy. So, you know, the lawyer linguists, they can't prescribe that, right? But the reality is that if somebody sits there and you're not a native language speaker, right? And they say, don't use this term, use this other one, you're going to go uh, ahead with that. And so I think that the reality or, and, and the uh, implication of this is that you actually have um, this kind of constraint on ambiguity and the kind of preciseness that is inserted into um, the, uh, into the legal, the, the production of legal texts that, um, uh, that, that I think is really different from a monolingual uh, environment. So, Neil, I just want to pick up uh, on something, a little bit of a tangent on something that you, you mentioned. And just to, if you could briefly um, respond to this. So, you, you made a comment that, you know, political scientists hadn't been very interested in language, especially in, 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 in the European, in the EU context, for a very long time. Um, and I wonder, given, of course, how important language is, which has become, you know, which, as we've been talking for the last hour, um, just, you know, sort of brief thought in terms of why that, that you know, language. Um, it took a while to, to realize perhaps the importance of language from a scholarly perspective um, among, among, at least among political scientists. 
I, I, I don't know. I think that one reason is that it's, it's, it's often difficult to measure, right? And, uh, you know, the kind of work that we do often relies on measurement, right? And the identification of, you know, concepts and variables and, um, and languages, you know, like if I, if I think about the kind of work that I've done where I've absolutely neglected the role of language, right? Like, you know, you write a paper about the assignment of rapporteurships in the European Parliament, right? Um, you know, I would almost, you know, I would, if some, you know, I would absolutely expect that language capacity probably is one of the factors that fact, you know, that plays a role in the assignment of these kinds of positions that, you know, on particularly important files, you want to have somebody who actually has high levels of English, right? Something like that, or maybe somebody who speaks some French, because then, you you know, and uh, that's usually something that's, you know, it, it's, 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 it's essentially a missing variable, right? So the way I think about this, on the one hand, is that language is often a kind of missing variable in a lot of research on the EU that has been done. And it's, you know, it's an empirical question whether or not if we accounted for language, you know, perhaps some of the um, conclusions that we've drawn um, might actually need to be revised in some way. Um, but the other way, you know, I, I do think that there's also something more profound going on, right? I think that, you know, the language, you know, like what I said about ambiguity, for example, right? There being a, a, a kind of push towards greater preciseness in the language of, you know, in, in essentially political texts, right? I, I think that that might matter in more fundamental ways. But again, measuring that kind of stuff is really difficult. And so I think that, you know, I, I don't want to accuse anybody of, you know, doing the, the convenient here, right? But I think that that is, is probably one reason. Well, thank and you. as I said, I'm, I'm totally guilty of this myself, right? So yes, as, as am I, as a, <laughs> from one political scientist to another. Katerina, do you want to, and then Karen on this? Uh yeah, I just wanted to add to what Niels was saying that um, there's also, I think, two more um, uh, sort of processes that we need that we need to, to be aware of on this. Firstly, I think it's the the impression that that some people may have that there is direct equivalence between two language between two or three languages. So um, and this is a well known, I think, sort of myth that there is equivalence between languages and as Karen very very well explained that this is this is not the case. And secondly, I think it's also because what what most people see in all these uh, multilingual deliberations in all the multilingual workings of EU institutions or or other international institutions such as the UN, for example, what we see is the result or the product um, of um, of deliberations or of uh, you know a written product or any or. or, or or any product that there is, or an output. We see the output and we don't actually see, it's not visible to us, or it's not readily available to us, the, the process or the procedures, which again, Karen has has um, has described. So I think these are also two um, processes that, that, that we need to be aware of. And I think that's why political scientists have probably, with, with some exceptions, obviously, uh, but have largely ignored language up until now. Karen, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so um, two points. So so this is mirrored in law as well as it, you see it mirrored in, in legal studies. Um, so the first point um, to just add to what Katrina is saying here um, is that the very fact that the EU you know, promotes this idea that there are 24 official languages and there's translations produced and, um, you know, they promote this idea that things are transposable from, from one language into another and that you can look at Article 5 of a piece of legislation in one language and find the exact paragraph in Article 5 in another language and, you know, understand in your own language what that means. So, so there, this myth is, you know, encouraged um through the narrative uh, of of the, sort of the very existence of the eu um and and then niels and i have, have actually talked about uh, this very issue in the past before um and um while there isn't much work in in political science um or in or in law uh, until recent years on this um work has been done in anthropological studies so there have been really interesting studies done um in the early 90s uh, by people like Irene Bellier, uh, Mark Abeles, and um, Mervyn MacDonald. I, uh, they've all produced you know, a, a quite a significant body of work looking at language and multilingualism and, and the importance of language in how EU institutions function. 
Um, but I, I suppose, you know, there's this difficulty with with speaking outside of your discipline. Um, so unless you're tapped into that, it's it's really hard uh, to find. But I, I can pop those names up in the chat uh, for anyone who's interested. But their work is really interesting. Yes. Can I just jump in on that part, sure. right? Yeah, a lot of their work is also in French, right? Which means that it does not actually trend, you know, it, it doesn't reach an audience that would be primarily English, right? So I, you know, my, my French is, is very limited. And uh, so, you know, working my way through some of that was actually very time consuming. And I'm sure that, you know, I should be citing them much more than I am in my work. And that's actually in part one of the reasons as well, which I think is, is interesting. Yeah, in the context of what we're talking about here. And I, I, th I think this is all, uh, you know, support for the, the need for um, talking across and uh, disciplines and going outside of our own disciplines and, and really the benefits of interdisciplinarity as well. Um, what we can learn from each other, which I think um, obviously this panel is, 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 is demonstrating. Um, I wanna turn um, uh, to um, another set of uh, of questions, and I'm, I'm aware of the time, and want to make sure that we have time to get to um, some further questions from from our uh, our virtual audience. Um, so something I brought up in the introduction that um, we haven't talked specifically about is this idea of politicization, and how language can both be um, like a unifier and a divider, which we also which we've also talked about quite a bit. But the idea of language um, politicizing but also depoliticizing as well. Um, and so, uh, and I, I'd like to address that um, perhaps and, 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 and how we can, how it can be at, at, at once um, both of those. So Katerina, I wonder if you could um, perhaps jump in on the politicization side um, of, of language first. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I lost the my screen for a moment. No. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we've already I think we've already touched upon um, ways in which language has been politicized, and I think our our colleagues in this um, in this call in this webinar have also um, talked about how language has been politicized, and we discussed you know the political dimensions of language uh, and language use. Um, at a social level, we discussed linguistic rights as human rights when languages are tied to their speakers. We discussed tensions between uh, official languages and minority languages, but we also uh, discussed brief briefly languages as performance of identity. And also something else that we um, mentioned that I think comes under the politicization of language is uh, also a criterion of language competence as a criterion for integration uh, when we talked about migration. And, um, you know, coming back to the question that, um, that I raised earlier, what does a multilingual Europe look like? We could ask then, what does integration look like, you know, for, for, for a migrant? What is an integrated migrant um, sound and, and look like and I think this is uh, connected to one of the questions that I'm looking in the chat as well I saw in the chat about language variation and language variants and how these are um, how these are seen and these are all deeply political questions but if I may uh, focus on perhaps one aspect that we haven't touched upon as much um, which is the the aspect of indigeneity and indigenous languages which is which has now which is now becoming um which is now being brought to the fore a lot more uh, this it's it's very similar with minority languages obviously but indigeneity as a concept is a, is a huge and contested uh, topic when we talk about indigenous languages because that is tied to the indigeneity of people um and that again is connected to resources and protection. Once something is designated as indigenous, was a language or speakers are designated as indigenous, then this guarantees a certain level of protection and a certain level of resources. But the question of who is indigenous and what languages can be classified as indigenous is, is, is a question that cannot be answered easily. There are European, uh, there are some, some, some definitions that have been given, but they're quite, they're quite broad. And in fact, I was, um, I was in a UNESCO forum the other day discussing indigenous languages and uh, digital inclusion, um, actually. And uh, when we discussed that very question, what languages are we talking about? What do we mean when we talk about indigenous languages? Um, again, there were there were variations. There was no one single definition that would help uh, from a legal point of view or from a practical point of view or from an institutional point of view. Um, 
so and this of course is tied to issues of identity and and, and recognition and anything that has to do with identity and recognition is sensitive and political and once we make these connections we see the political relevance really um really clearly um and really for speakers if i can come back to the speakers for speakers of um of these languages uh, the choice of language they use in public spheres or in institutions is a deeply political one it has nothing to do with intelligibility anymore it, it, it's, it's a political choice great thank you uh, niels do you want to talk about the flip side of this you talk about how language can depoliticize yes um and and i should say though that that my argument you know the argument that i that i make about uh, multilingualism, you know, depoliticizing is, is one that, uh, you know, I make specifically with regard to the institutions, right? So what happens inside the institutions? Um, um, and, and uh, you know, basically what I, I suggest in, in, you know, the book that, um, that JJ mentioned uh, early on um, that's going to come out in a little while is that um, the political in EU uh, politics inside the institutions is partially suppressed by essentially both the linguistic limitations of those involved in making political decisions and also by their reliance on uh, this indirect communication through uh, interpretation and translation. So, you know, on the one hand, you have people using non-native languages, and when they use a non-native language, their, their linguistic repertoires are necessarily limited. Um, so they, they use less complex language, fewer rhetorical embellishments, and they rely on kind of commonly used terms, phrases, uh, and expressions. Um, and, uh, you know, effective communication between non-native native speakers of a shared language um, you know, really requires people to focus on getting their message across. So language takes on this kind of very functional uh, uh, quality. Uh, it also requires people uh, to give each other the benefit of the doubt, right? Because uh, you, you don't always know what the intent of the other speaker is, right? And so if somebody uses a particular term or expression, it might not be used with, uh, with intent. And based on the uh, conversations that I've had inside the EU institutions, people are very aware of that. And they're basically, you know, very tolerant of this. Um, so if somebody, for example, uses a politically charged term like illegal alien, right, which in other contexts might signify a particular take on the issue. Um, in the EU, this ends up getting discounted uh, because you don't know if that person perhaps used that term because they didn't know a different or a better one. Um, and so all of that basically then mutes the potential for conflict uh, in part because uh, EU actors are less distinguishable um, based on their, you know, in, in terms of the extent to which what they say reflects their or is indicative of their national backgrounds and ideological learnings. And the reliance on translators and interpreters has a similar effect. Um, so even the highest quality translation and interpretation, and that's probably what we've got in the EU, um, is, is, you know, something that transforms communication. So it takes in intensity out of political debate, it simplifies and standardizes language, because again, uh, kind of complex languages are used in a more straightforward fashion, um, and that all of that then kind of mutes uh, politically charged and emotionally charged uh, language. And so overall, right, both foreign language use and reliance on translation results in communication that is more simple, utilitarian, uh, neutralized, and standardized, all of which then kind of, you know, diminishes the expression of political differences. Yeah. Thank you, Niels. Um, for those of you who haven't just joined us and are wondering what happened to uh, Dr. Spoon, I'm Alison Delnor. I'm the Associate Director of the Center, and I'm just taking over on the Q&A not trying to insert, but I do have to say I have very much relied on the um, giving people a little bit of slack, cutting them slack when they're operating in their second language, and it's been very helpful for me in my personal life. Um, but I see that Michaela has a has a hand up. Yes, if I can contribute to this question. <clears throat> in my opinion, uh, the, the European Union is perceived as, uh, by European citizens as um, is a, as an organization that is not really politicized and uh, uh, lack of communication in different languages from its institutions, in my opinion, is one of the, the main issues. Um, the president of European Commission, um, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, she uses mostly English to talk to uh, people. Um, uh, political parties in the European Union uh, they don't have any specific language policy to address citizens at any elections. European elections are basically a test for national politics. No one cares about uh, European elections as 
election to vote for the European Parliament. And this is a very important issue. We don't vote in Europe, I mean, you know, European citizens, they don't vote in Europe because they know what they are doing. They don't vote for the European Parliament. They know that there is an election and they vote basically for national parties. Uh, it's, it's quasi if they were voting for a national election. So European elections are seen as a test. And the problem, one of the problems that has been addressed by others, by Bonotti and Stojanovic, is because European parties, uh, the Socialist Party and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Popular and the Liberals, and so there are different parties, I'm not going to make the list here, but the most important, say, fam political families, they don't address citizens. There is no EU-wide uh, electoral campaign. Uh, the European U Union Commission is seen as a technocratic structure speaking in English, so a language that the vast majority of European citizens don't speak. Uh, this, is, this must be uh, you know, told and repeated. The vast majority of European citizens have very limited knowledge of the English language, and, uh, uh, or at best they have intermediate knowledge. Um, um, uh, no more than 10% of European citizens after Brexit is able to use English at a proficient level or as native speaker. So you can imagine what does it mean in terms of, poli of politics. So uh, the language question is a huge question because the predominant of English of the English language in the European Union at the moment depoliticize politics from the European Union towards citizens. And this is the biggest problem we have. Uh, in my opinion in Europe because the European Union should really in, in political parties, in the European Union, uh, the Commission, I mean, European Union should embrace multilingualism properly uh, rather than relying on a very old model of one nation, one language, one, uh, one, uh, one state that was predominant in Europe in the 19th century. They are basically replicated the same model at the European level uh, by relying mostly on one uh, language only, which after Brexit has become the language of just 1% of the population. Have a look, for example, at all web pages of the European Commission. One third of them, they are available in English only. How do you think that people can embrace the European Union as a political project if they don't understand what is written there? Even in, in areas like agriculture, uh, where most of people are monolingual, most of people working in that area, uh, agricultural companies, they work predominantly in, in, in French, in Dutch, or in the, the, which are the largest uh, agricultural countries in the European Union. These web pages are available just in English, French, and German, and all the rest. Uh, farmers in Romania and in Bulgaria, they are excluded from communication. These are the most important, in my opinion, from the point of view of language policy, at least, issues. Uh, it's very important that the European, you know, uh, Eurocrats working in the European Union start to talk to the people. And we're very important that political parties, just as they do in Switzerland, which is a multilingual nation, they are able to make and organize political campaigns for European elections in many languages. We need in Europe, European multilingual elites. And this is not what is happening now because of uh, educational policies at the national level, they are pushing towards monolingualism, not plurilingualism. Um, in, in teaching foreign languages and where second language is usually very, 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 very weak. So we have huge problems uh, concerning the politicization of the European Union towards citizens, which is eventually what matters the most. Yeah, I think that's an exceptionally important point. And I just want to give it a chance in case anybody else wants to speak to sort of this disconnect between kind of multilingualism as policy and and monolingual or people who don't have English as one of the languages in terms of connecting citizens to the EU. If I just, you know, okay, I mean, how can you connect to citizens uh, when, you know, uh, you don't use the languages spoken by these citizens, you are not going to reach their hearts. Your politics is just about that. And Nelson Mandela clearly told, he wrote it in his, uh, 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 his book, you know, Memories of His Own Life. You know, if you want to reach the brain of people, you can talk in English, but if you want to reach their heart, they have to go to their nat the native language, and they don't do that. And, uh, and, and this is why, you know, there's an there's a, there's a increasing gap between bureaucracy on the one hand and, and, and European citizens on the other hand. And I'm, I don't believe 
if I can add just a final word of that, and I, you know, I know that other people want to talk. I don't think that the spread of one single language such as English can improve any sense of European identity or, of, uh, or, or, or effectiveness in communication. The largest English speaking country, the UK left, they had access to all documents. They, ha they had a huge uh, a comparative advantage to any European country and they left. And during the last uh, uh, crisis due to coronavirus, when the European Union had to decide whether to adopt a solidarity pact, the countries were, that were absolutely against any form of financial solidarity towards the Southern European countries were precisely those countries called the frugals, where the knowledge of English is as a foreign language is the highest, namely not ahead in the Netherlands, Finland, uh, Sweden, and Austria. So I don't see any connection between the spread of this language and any, any source of European identity of increase of solidarity. You see, so the other way around, if the European Union is going to use more and more the national language of the European people, then the European people will start to perceive the European Union as something that belongs to them. It's not there, Neil. Uh, yeah, let, let me just uh, uh, add a couple of things here. So one, uh, or maybe take away a couple of things from what Michaela said. So one of them uh, is that I, I, I completely agree that there, there is this really important distinction between internal and external communication. Um, and I think that the, you know, EU does okay and pretty well even on internal communication. And, you know, I talked to, you know, almost 100 people inside the institutions and the overall overwhelming takeaway was that the language regime works for them, uh, which I thought was really notable in part because, um, you know, often there's an emphasis on all the dysfunction, right? Uh, and, and that was certainly not what, what came out of those conversations that I had. Uh, but I agree that on the, ex you know, on the external side, it, it, this internal communication actually makes things worse, right? Because you have people who are using this kind of neutral, standardized, strange language. And, you, you know, it's, it's not just using English, it's using that English, right? Like that is, I think, an especially uh, uh, problematic. So I think that the EU would be very uh, well advised to be very, really careful in, you know, not having this kind of, the, the kind of weird EU language kind of bleed into external communication, because I think that that would actually contribute to the problems that Michaela talked about. I would say, though, that uh, I think I think actually part of the problem is that the EU has become more politicized over time, right? So I think that what Michaela was saying uh, was, uh, you know, more true 10, 15 years ago than it is now. Um, and so, you know, there's a bunch of research recently that has talked about the different ways in which the EU has become an issue of, con you know, contestation uh, within uh, domestic politics. And so I think that, you know, uh, uh, what he's pointing out is actually, in a way, made worse by this, you know, depoliticized language internally, and then, uh, you know, it really doesn't speak to the politicization that, um, you know, otherwise uh, occurs. Thanks. That actually brings up, we've had a number of questions in the Q&A um, related to English. So I think this is sort of a, reg a good segue for that. And the first, I think, might be a kind of quick one, which is, and I think you've sort of addressed it, but we'll take it head on, but just what will be the effect of Brexit on English as a working language of the EU? Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on to something about a little more nuanced than that. Does anybody want to take that one? I'm happy to jump in on that one. Uh, yes, uh, I don't think there really is going to be any effect. I mean, we're, it's. I don't think it's going to be possible to sort of. They're not going to switch overnight to, uh, you know, starting to use another language as, as a working language in, say, the Commission, Parliament, Council, where they tend to use English as 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 a working language. There are arguments, however, that um, since the English that is used in the EU institutions is now no longer linked in a way to a big member state um, and, and is not in fact the first official language of any uh, EU member state. Uh, both Ireland and Malta, Malta have Irish and Maltese respectively as their first official languages. Um, you know there are there are scholars who argue that it, that it as Anil says becomes this language of depoliticization, excuse me, I can't pronounce things now. Um, the, the problem is, though, that a the, the you know, it's this very it's this international, it's this European English that's very specific to the institutions, uh, which is all very well as as Neil uh, has pointed out and and has written quite extensively about you know and has done a lot of empirical work on. That's not a problem at the EU level, but it does become problematic when um, coming down to the member state level. So from the point of view of law, for example, 
um, everybody at the EU level knows what they mean and knows that there's a fudge and, and uh, you know, this, yeah, depoliticized language. Um, but that language then has to have legal effect throughout 27 member states. And, and it becomes quite difficult where we can't guarantee or, or you know, those working at, at, at the level of EU institutions can't guarantee that the people applying the law or interpreting the law in member states are going to understand it in exactly the same way that they do. Um, and I think that is where it becomes very problematic. And that is where I think work like what, what, what Niels is doing is really important just to allow, you know, to open the veil a bit or, you know, pull, pull the veil back a bit and let sort of legal elites or political elites in member states be more aware of, of what language means and the role that language plays in the creation of these policies and, and these laws. But the short answer is no, I don't think there'll be a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Katerina, do you have a uh, yes, I just wanted to add to what Karen was saying that I agree that I, I don't think there's going to be a big difference. Um, and I just wanted to share the fact that I, I just read on the news yesterday uh, that the EU vaccine passport, which uh, which the EU is um, is now introducing because of uh, because of coronavirus. So this EU vaccine passport will be available in the national language and in English. So. Uh, you know, ergo, uh, I, I don't think change uh, is going to to happen at least in the um, at least in the English speaking or, or, or writing practices or in these sort of practices. But one thing that I sort of thought of and I wrote it in the chat and maybe we can um, maybe we can think about is that perhaps we will be start hearing more Irish accents coming out of the EU interpreting booths, um, which um, you know is going to be fun. Well, that's always fun. Miguel. Yeah. <laughs> Miguel? Oh, yes. So uh, um, regarding, you know, the question very briefly, I think that as regards internal communication, slowly French and German are going to have a more important role because at some point, you know, uh, by the simple force of demographics, there will be more and more proportionally, at least, civil servants, uh, coming from these two large countries, and um, these people live and work in Brussels or in Luxembourg. So I think there will be an increased use of French at some point. And there are already um, many declarations of French politicians saying that uh, there's no reason to continue to use uh, standard English if European, if the United Kingdom uh, left, which is of course not true because English is the main language in Ireland. Very, very few people speak Irish, um, uh, 88,000 88, uh, Irish people are native speaker of Irish out of a population of about 5 million. So uh, English must be maintained for a sort of linguistic democracy. That, uh, concerning the, 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 the role of English in general in the European Union, this is beyond the European Union powers. It depends on the languages taught in the schools. Um, uh, and therefore, I'm not surprised that the vaccine is going to be I mean, the vaccine passport in two languages. Um, this is something that national, sta national, national states, they decide which languages to teach. And they invested so much in English over the last 50 years. And I don't think they're going to change dramatically in the next uh, couple of years. It may be that some countries will start to teach more languages. This is possible. So um, we had so many more questions. I'm going to let Nils um, answer, and then we're going to unfortunately leave some questions unanswered. But um, Nils, please. I, I just wanted to add one little thing, which is I think that you know we're going to hear more Irish, uh, and I think we're going to hear more funny English, right? The the kind of weird, you know, it, it, like to some extent it may be reined in uh, right now by the fact that there are you know more native English speakers who might say you know like that is a weird construction. That's not really what we say. Um, but I think that you know we might hear more of that uh, you know th th there might be more of a trajectory towards uh, you know more a, a more particular um, uh, EU uh, English that that's even more different than it is now from standard English in some ways. And given the variations over what is standard English, um, I think it it is interesting to think about what the impact of this kind of bureaucratic English and world English is on actual you know on English and how it's spoken around the world and even in primarily predominantly English speaking countries. 
Um, we could be talking about this, I think, for a very long time, given the questions that we're getting and how um, and how much there is to say about everything. But unfortunately, we have come to the end. So I want to thank our panelists for an excellent discussion. This was incredibly thought provoking and interesting. Um, and I think um, and I want to thank all of the people who joined us today. And I just want to thank also our funders, um, the US Department of Education through Title VI of National Resource Centers and the European Commission through the Erasmus Plus program. Um, please take a moment to complete a survey that you'll be getting afterwards or that you'll also see in the chat because um, we really love to get your feedback and um, so that we can help plan future, um, future programs. Thank you all. <laughs>